Good evening and welcome to APTN National News. I'm Daryl Stranger. We begin tonight in the Yukon where First Nations children and families might be experiencing increased abuse, isolation and neglect because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Since the pandemic began, social services have noticed a drop in the number of child welfare calls from schools and daycares, as well as from families seeking social supports. In response, the Yukon Council of First Nations and the Yukon government have launched a multimedia ad campaign that will let children and families that have been left isolated by the COVID-19 pandemic know that there is help available. We need to be as innovative as we possibly can to get the services out and I'm really excited about this initiative. I think it gets us closer aligned and just reaches further into the communities to let them know that we have not forgotten about them, that we're still here and we, we're, we certainly are concerned and we want to support them. The World Health Organization says it's not too late for the spread of COVID-19 to be stemmed. As case numbers and deaths continue to climb globally, the head of the WHO says adhering to basic public health principles such as hand washing and mask wearing is the most effective way to beat the virus. Many people ask us saying, what do you think will happen in a year from now? My, our answer is always it's in our hands. And the reason for this is since the outbreak started, Many countries have shown that it can be controlled. The comments come as the WHO confirms its advanced team sent to China to examine the virus's origins has completed its work in Wuhan. It will still be months, however, before their investigation is complete. As of today, there are more than 18 million confirmed cases of COVID-19 worldwide and nearly 690,000 people have died. A young girl says her dog was taken without permission from the Pemissikamak Cree Nation in northern Manitoba when a dog rescue organization came to her community. Her teacher, Andrea McIver, has been working with her family to get the dog returned. She joins us now from Winnipeg. Hi, Andrea. Thanks for joining us. Uh, let's just jump right into it. Where is the dog now? Actually, there are several dogs. Um, I've been advocating for one of my students whose dog went missing but there's another family from the community who's also missing their dog, Sammy. So to the best of my knowledge, there's two dogs missing, but there is also another gentleman from Cross Lake, uh, Melvin McLeod, whose dog went missing when the animal rescue were in. So I'm, I, I don't know what's going on with his dog though. How many dogs are missing from Pemissikamak uh, in total? Um, I. Well, if you count Melvin's, there's three. Um, you, mentioned, you asked before where the dogs are now. Well, they're in Ontario. They're in the, I guess, custody of a group called Lost Boys Hope. And they've been asked repeatedly to return the dogs by our chief and council, by the families. But so far, it's been very frustrating because we haven't, it's been two months and the dogs aren't back. And that leads uh, right into my next question. So how has this process been of getting the dog returned? Oh, <clears throat> well, the dogs first went missing when um, Lost Boys Hope left our community on June 5th. And usually we have a process. Um, what happens is pictures are posted on, on local media, like the Cross Lake Band of Indians Facebook page or the Cross Lake Lost Pets Network. And the pictures are posted and families will be able to see if their animal has been mistakenly taken. Unfortunately, they didn't post due to our terrible internet connectivity in the north until June 7th. So it wasn't until June 7th that the dogs were able to be identified um, for any kind of media trail. But as soon as they were, um, both Raina, my student, identified her dog and Hilary Moni Monias identified her dog, Sammy. And since then, it's been a lot of runaround. The rescue has said um, initially that they would send the dogs back. 
I've seen all of the emails and messaging between the um, animal rescue organizations. And it's just been a, I don't know the plate word for it. It's, it's been a really circuitous route because it's been, okay, June 7th, we'll send the dogs back. Oh, the 15th, um, Lost Boys Hope writes to our chief and says, no, we want to keep these dogs. Do you expect any dogs back? Like kicking the family right out of any negotiations. So it's, I think the biggest word is frustrating. So what is the community doing to keep this from happening again, Andrea? Oh, no, that's, that's the easiest part of it all. Um, because of the exposure of us writing online and talking about these missing dogs, we've had several people all across Canada put their heads together to try to help us find some solutions. So right now, there's a group of women based out of Ontario and British Columbia, um, personal friends, community members from Cross Lake who are getting tags together blank tags and we have a person who's volunteered to engrave them we're collecting uh, ten dollars per tag of course you know if, if somebody can't afford to get a tag for their dog we will find a way to sponsor them and we're going to put together we're calling it operation dog tag <laughs> and we'll take any monies that we make and we'll put it back into helping pets into the community and do you have any advice if someone thinks uh, a dog uh, rescue may have taken their pet? That's a really good question. This has been a really hard process. If you're from a northern community or a native indigenous community, make sure you first find, I'd say, a reputable media source that you can actually talk to that won't misquote you and won't go on general assumptions about where you're from and how you treat animals because that has been one of the hardest things to combat since this started. People make a lot of assumptions about Cross Lake from Michigamac and how we treat animals. So that's Perfect. probably the best advice I can give. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks, Andrea. That's Andrea McIver joining us from Winnipeg. Thank you. If you want to learn more details about this story, you can go to aptnnews.ca. It's time for a short break, but stay with us. Jesse Dame joins us from Vancouver, where he is now the Two-Spirit Program Manager at the Vancouver Community Research-Based Centre. That's coming up. Beginning on the East Coast, 25 in St. John's and 30 in Sun in Halifax. 20, 20 degrees in Nain and 22 in Happy Valley Goose Bay. 21 in Quebec City and 18 in Val d'Or. 24 in Peterborough and 20 in Sault Ste. Marie. 18 in Wawa and 25 in Sioux Lookout. 28 in Sun in Thompson and 30 in Sun in Churchill. 27 in Sun in Winnipeg and 26 in Brandon. 27 in a mix of sun and cloud and swift current, and 25 in Regina. 22 degrees in La Ronge and 25 in Stony Rapids. Welcome back. Those calling for inclusion of the Iroquois Nationals at the 2022 World Games got a little hope last week. Officials confirmed that they're exploring whether a change to the format for lacrosse's competition is necessary. The International World Games Association, World Lacrosse, and the World Games 2022 Birmingham Organizing Committee issued a joint statement Thursday. Without naming the Iroquois Nationals, the three groups said they want to keep the games inclusive while also remaining committed to the approved eligibility criteria. All are, quote, very keen to reach an early agreement. We want to hear what you think about the Iroquois Nationals. Here's how to continue the conversation. Send your emails to news at aptn.ca. Find us online at aptnnews.ca and on youtube.com slash aptnnews. Also, you can follow APTN News on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for more Indigenous news. 
In June, the British Columbia government launched an independent investigation into the systemic racism faced by Indigenous peoples in the healthcare system. The Vancouver Community-Based Research Centre wants to make sure Two-Spirited Indigenous people participate in that investigation. Jesse Dame is the Two-Spirit Program Manager at the Centre and spoke to Dennis Ward last week from Vancouver. Jesse, thanks for taking some time for us here. Can you tell us about the Community-Based Research Centre and the Two-Spirit Program? Yeah, for sure. So the Community Based Research Center is a nonprofit organization that started here in BC in 1999 and since we've grown uh, nationally um, and is an organization that focuses on developing queer, two-spirit, gay, bi, trans uh, resources for men who have sex with men or identify in that realm. Um, my position is uh, actually brand new. It's the Indigenous Two-Spirit Program Manager. So my primary goal in this position is to connect and create and provide supports to the Two-Spirit community as well as the Indigenous community as a whole to try and decrease barriers to access to services. So a major part of my job will be the development of uh, at-home testing um, program. So for HIV, syphilis, chlamydia, gonorrhea um, and a number of other STIs that we can um, treat. So we're going to create a program um, so that we can either ship the items or the testing kits to, at home to remote communities or um, either get access in some way. I can only imagine there's uh, you know, additional discrimination against two-spirited people and the LGBTQ community. Uh, would that be your understanding here too? Absolutely. We um, definitely experience and have reports of a number um, of Indigenous Two-Spirit folks as well as queer folks, period, uh, and the discrimination um, that occurs within healthcare settings. You work as a nurse in the healthcare system. Have you seen any of this firsthand? Uh, unfortunately, yes, I have. So um, I, I am a registered nurse and I've been a nurse for about six years. My background is postpartum NICU, so with preterm infants, and then I've been working in sexual health for the last three years. Um, unfortunately, when I did work postpartum nursery uh, and in the NICU, I did experience a fair bit of discrimination, even um, similar things that we're going to be talking about today, but betting games about how many pregnancies young Indigenous moms have had um, and comments around pregnancy rates among Indigenous women. Can you tell us a bit on why you uh, feel this is an important role for the investigation? Well, as we know, I mean, um, the stats on Indigenous health period are extremely uh, decreased when we're comparing to non-Indigenous folks. So having any barrier period identified um, can benefit and hopefully increase health outcomes. So by bringing more attention to the survey, getting people to report their experiences of discrimination, hopefully the outcome can be some healing for the people themselves who are reporting uh, these stories, but as well as to decrease or challenge the current uh, racism that's happening and hopefully in the end increase health outcomes or improve health outcomes. And so Jesse, for people wanting to get in touch with you to take part in the investigation, uh, how do they do that? Yeah, so we can send them to the, uh, I can share the CBRC blog post or go to cbrc.net uh, and it's the first thing on the top where you can click read the blog that we discussed and uh, links to the survey. The survey was open until July 30th, but they actually just extended it now to August 6th. Uh, so this is for Indigenous and non-Indigenous people who have experienced uh, discrimination or witnessed discrimination. Um, there, it, it can be any experiences uh, within hospital settings or healthcare facilities, period. So everybody can take part and report these incidences. And thanks for that. Uh, Jesse, we'll leave it there. Appreciate you taking some time for us. Of course. Thank you. That is Jesse Dame, the Two-Spirit Program Manager at the Vancouver Community-Based Research Centre. We have to take one more break, but coming up, the Winnipeg Trails Association are incorporating Indigenous culture into downtown Winnipeg. We'll show you how after the break. Over to the West Coast now, 26 in Sun and Fort McMurray and 25 in Peace River. 25 in Sun and Calgary and 28 in Sun and Lethbridge. 24 in a mix of Sun and Cloud in Vancouver and 33 in Kamloops. 25 in Sun and Fort Nelson and 23 in Sun and Prince George. 20 degrees in Beaver Creek and 21 in Mayo. 26 in Yellowknife and 18 in Fort Simpson. 21 in Colville Lake and 21 in Fort McPherson. 
25 in Sun and Chesterfield, and 31 in Baker Lake. 7 degrees in Clyde River, and 16 in Sun and Cape Dorset. Welcome back. The members of the Winnipeg Trails Association are getting their hands dirty this summer. And by doing so, they're incorporating Indigenous culture into downtown Winnipeg and creating safer streets for pedestrians and bikers. Michelle Carlenzig has more. These young members of the Healing Trails Project are etching Cree and Ojibwe words into wood. The words will be on 10 cedar planters, which line a downtown Winnipeg street. The planters are also filled with vegetables and traditional herbs and medicines. The safety of the streets and bringing the neighbourhood together is what Healing Trails Project is all about. Janelle Henry, project manager, explains the idea behind the project. They're actually a COVID response to the open street so that there's more room for people to walk around, but they also double as a pathway for language revitalization and bringing like Cree and Ojibwe back into the landscape. Executive Director Anders Swanson says because of the pandemic, it was important for people to be able to walk outside. The planters give everyone a bit of space. So we started the Healing Trails program to kind of um, to address uh, m multiple things at the same time while again while while turning that leadership over and um, a, a pandemic hit suddenly people were needing to get outside really really badly needing to get healthy so so this actual project came out of um, and you see it's working yeah. right there that's what this is about so this street can sometimes be a drag strip and there's people on here we've known this for almost two decades now we've been trying to fix it um, because people are out here with strollers and they're biking with their kids and then somebody comes flying down in a car and it ruins what this place could be the planters are also a way for people to learn about culture and to stay safe henry's focus is for healing the past present and future we all know that Indigenous people have experienced profound trauma on this land. And so um, psychologist Dr. Eduardo Duran says, in order for healing to take place, it has to happen on the land and where, where the trauma occurred. So there's lots of trauma here. And so by doing these types of programs, we're healing the land and healing the people by healing the collective trauma. The boxes will be up until September 7th of this year, and Winnipeg Trails hopes to carry on the program next summer. Michelle Karlenzig, APTN National News, Winnipeg. An academic in Edmonton is hoping to reunite some very special photos with an Inuit family and carvings with a regional cultural centre. Elena McDougall has more. So these are a couple of the little tiny figures. You can see how small they are. Valerie Hanatuck and her husband purchased a lot at an auction that may be of interest to an Inuit family or cultural center in Labrador. The lot includes some personal photos. <laughs> the descendants of these individuals uh, would presumably love to have these original photos. They're a little damaged, as I said. They're not in great condition, but they are the original photos from that time. And somebody would love to be able to identify their great-grandmother or... Um, those sort of things. There are no names on the photos except for the name of John Golby, who Hennetuck believes was a Moravian missionary. From my research, it seems he was based in uh, Hopedale up on the Labrador coast in Nunatsiavut around 1905, 1906, somewhere in that or somewhere in that range. Uh, but the photos on the back say, for example, this is a particularly beautiful one of this young woman, and it just says wedding dress on the back so no indication of who she is or specifically when it might have been taken. Hennetuck is hoping that whoever can identify the items will reach out. It's important that artifacts um, not be divorced from their context from from where they where they belong and where they have meaning too many um, items both text and uh, artifacts photos um, were so taken from community and I think it's really important to connect back to community um, and you know my husband and I had always hoped that as we collect things eventually we do hope to donate them to appropriate places if, if we can find the right places for that uh, in a modest way. Anyone with information can reach out to Valerie Hennetuck on Facebook. 
Elena McDougall, APTN National News, Hamilton. Northern women are well known for their beading and sewing skills, but now eight artists are learning how to take their works to the next level to promote a sustainable fur industry. In this encore story, Charlotte Moore Jacobs spoke with some of the participants who took part in a sealskin workshop. Jerry Sharp was only nine years old when she sold her first sealskin upek to the co-op for a bag of chips. She's come a long way. Where I'm from, it, we're Natilit Muta, so we're people of the seal. So it, it's, I prefer working with seal. And then I was like, the level of skill here is evident. And this week in Yellowknife, eight artisans are taking part in a multi-day seal liberation workshop. They're refining their sewing skills to create high-quality products for local markets. Funded by the Northwest Territories government, the workshop is led by renowned Dene designer Darcy Moses. Learning different techniques on making uh, like a, a nice marketable product and finishing techniques so that their work is professionally finished as opposed to like raw cement allowances or... For Sharf, learning alongside other Indigenous women sewing feels natural. My purse um, and the beadwork, I, I'd already had the beadwork done. Um, so I asked, I had three different pieces, so I asked everybody what they thought. And then the idea of doing that, we just it, everybody gave me a little bit of information. So They are making sealskin items like bags, hats, and belts, which are affordable and easy to produce in a local market like Yellowknife. It's Susie Nakashuk Zettler's second year participating. Like last year, I was kind of rushing and I was too excited. So we have more confidence now to sew anything. Zettler says she's excited to sell sealskin hats. Like I'm learning to sell my art because I always undervalue my art because the way um, maybe how I grew up, like everything was given to people that needed it. And I mean, like, you need mitts or you need jacket. And why did you put this through? The creations take hours to make and a lot of patience. <laughs> but it's the cultural exchange you can't put a price on. Any type of workshop is going to, there's going to be conversation about culture and what things were like and how things are caught and what, what you do with things. So that, that conversation happens naturally. Charlotte Moore Jacobs, APTN National News, Yellowknife. That's been your look at APTN National News for this Monday. For more Indigenous news, you can visit our website at aptnnews.ca. I'm Daryl Stranger. Have a great night.